Okay, so I'm going to focus um, on implantable hemodynamic monitoring, but I'm really going to take you on a journey uh, of how we got there and talk a little bit about what I think the future may hold. So first of all, why is this important? Well, I, I know I don't need to convince this our audience that heart failure represents a major and growing public health concern. Despite current therapies and disease management approaches, the rate of heart failure hospitalization remains unacceptably high. There are more than a million heart failure hospitalizations annually in the U.S. That's where heart failure is the primary cause of hospitalization. Heart failure is the number one cause of hospitalization for those uh, age 65 years or greater. It is the number one cause of hospital readmission, and this is when compared to all other medical or surgical causes of hospitalization. I mean, think about that. In the Medicare population, the 30-day readmission rate for heart failure is 27 percent. And we spend uh, in excess of 18 billion, that's billion with a B, 18 billion dollars on the direct costs of managing decompensated heart failure, hospitalization costs for heart failure. And unfortunately, what we've been doing, and I think this has become a common theme today, uh, what we've been doing, our current methods for monitoring and managing heart failure patients have not adequately addressed this problem. So we really do need a new paradigm. So first of all, how do we keep heart failure patients out of the hospital? Well, while there are a lot of parameters which, which may be important, such as cardiac output or blood pressure, it turns out that perhaps the most important and what is the proximate cause for heart failure admission in about 90% of patients is retention of fluid and elevation of intracardiac and pulmonary artery pressures, what we call clinical congestion. These patients become wet and more breathless and more edematous and they get admitted to the hospital. So our goal is to maintain an optimal fluid or pressure status because when patients are too wet, they have increased symptoms, they're at increased risk for hospitalization, they're increased risk for arrhythmias and perhaps sudden cardiac death, and their mortality is higher. On the other hand, we don't want to dry them out too much because when they're too dry, they have low blood pressures, they complain of dizziness or lightheadedness, they're at risk for syncope and for worsening kidney function. So the key here is to get this just right. When patients are neither too wet or too dry and they're just right, they feel well, and as I'll show you, they are at low risk, perhaps the lowest risk for hospitalization or for mortality. So let me tell you uh, uh, about what I consider to be the prerequisites for success in remote monitoring and heart failure. And I think that this uh, will, will go along very nicely with some of the presentations we've already heard and some that we're yet to hear, and is really based on 25 years of experience in, in the study and testing of a variety of remote telemedicine or telemonitoring systems in heart failure. And, and hopefully this will be easy for you to remember because there are essentially five A's here. Uh, I'll, I'll put them up in bold face print on the slide as, as we go through this slide. So the first prerequisite is that we, we must have, we must measure the appropriate signals. That is, our sensors must measure the underlying pathophysiology leading to worsening heart failure symptoms and events. We've got to measure the right thing. Secondly, those sensors must be accurate. They have to give us accurate, valid, reproducible measurements uh, of what it is that we are, are, are uh, uh, trying to target. Sensors must provide absolute values rather than relative ones. Now, now I, I, I may be convinced based on some discussions from this morning that through artificial intelligence and machine learning, eventually we might better understand relative change as a means to managing heart failure patients. But at the present time, and again based on those 25 years of experience, I would say if you're developing a sensor for the management of heart failure, you've got to rely on something that, that is an absolute value. And the example that I'll cite here is transthoracic or intrathoracic impedance, which gives us a relative measure of lung wetness or dryness but not an absolute one. So we never know when the lung is normally dry and when it's wet, we don't know how wet it is. 
and now in multiple clinical trials, both transthoracic and intrathoracic impedance have failed to help keep patients out of the hospital. I'll show you one example of that a little bit later, and I'll show you also show you an example of, of uh, absolute measurement of lung fluid content, which has the potential to keep patients out of the hospital. The information must be directly actionable. I know that term has come up multiple times uh, already today, and perhaps it seems a little bit cliche, but really clinicians need to know what to do with the data. Do you increase the dose of the diuretic? Do you decrease it? Do you add a vasodilator or increase the dose of it? Do you push neurohormonal inhibitors and antagonists? What do you do with the information? And again, I'll come back to uh, contrasting intrathoracic impedance with implantable hemodynamic monitoring. Who, who, of, who of us in the audience knows what to do uh, with uh, a change in the optival fluid threshold? or level. I don't. And I've studied this a lot and thought about it a lot and, and, and all I know is it tells me my patient's at risk and it makes me worry a lot. So, so I lose some sleep, but I, I don't know if that means I should increase the diuretic or change the dose of a vasodilator or bring the patient into the clinic. Uh, and finally, we need treatment algorithms. We need to guide practice based on this this, this, this accurate, absolute, and actionable data. And of course, in the end, we need to demonstrate an improvement in patient symptoms and clinical outcomes. So those are the five A's I think are the prerequisites for success in remote monitoring and heart failure. So now let me tell you a story, and I'm gonna frame this story based on what we've learned over the past two or three decades about the natural history or progression of heart failure from compensated stable heart failure to decompensated heart failure requiring hospitalization. And I'm gonna use a scheme here that was published uh, in a paper uh, uh, authored by Phil Adamson in 2009. And what you see here is that what we've called over the years acute heart failure or acute decompensated heart failure, we have learned is really rarely acute. Yes, patients may acutely go into pulmonary edema if they have a myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock or a new arrhythmia or perhaps rupture of a papillary muscle. But in chronic heart failure patients, the, the road to heart failure hospitalization is a gradual one. It occurs over many days to many weeks, generally with the retention of a small amount of fluid each day until the patient acutely becomes more symptomatic. So it's acute are the symptoms, but what is not acute is the natural history leading to a heart failure hospitalization. So if we look at some of the changes that occur the physiological markers along this road to worsening heart failure, it turns out that the latest manifestations are weight changes and heart failure symptoms. And perhaps that's why, and we saw some of this evidence presented earlier today, uh, studies, clinical trials looking at remote telemanagement of weights and symptoms uh, really haven't helped us keep very many patients out of the hospital. I'll show you one study, and it'll turn out to be an example that's already been shown, so I'll move through it quickly. But it's, it, 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 it is one of now dozens of randomized controlled trials that tell us the same thing. So that brings me to what I call Chapter 1. And you may wonder, where did I get this title of the, the overall talk, uh, Remote Monitoring Heart Failure, Quality and Quality Out? Well, I think it is the opposite of the old computer programmer's uh, adage, garbage in, garbage out. So I'm going to start here with chapter one, which is the garbage in, garbage out chapter, and that is our focus over the past three decades on telemedical systems focused on heart failure signs, symptoms, and daily weight monitoring. We were excited uh, in the late 2000s because there was one of these Cochrane meta-analyses that took several small underpowered studies and suggested that telemedical monitoring of signs, symptoms, and daily weights could reduce total mortality and the number and duration of hospital admissions for worsening heart failure over a period of follow-up of 6 to 12 months. However, since that time, numerous, now many, subsequent large prospective randomized controlled multicenter clinical trials of non-invasive telemedical approaches have not corroborated these findings. You know many of these trials, TIMHF, 
Tele HF, the TENS HF trial, and the one that I chose to share with you today because it's one of the most recently published, and you also heard about a bit about this earlier, is the BEAT HF trial. Now, I chose this for two reasons. One, it's a relatively recent, recently published study, and two, some of you participated in this trial. So, so this was a trial that was done at six academic medical centers in California. It enrolled patients with acute decompensated heart failure 50 years of age or older. The intervention combined health coaching, telephone calls, and telemonitoring, daily electronic collection of blood pressure, heart rate, symptoms, and weight, and then centralized nurses conducted telemonitoring reviews enacted protocolized actions and made telephone calls to these patients. That's a lot of stuff, just about uh, throwing everything that you possibly can at the patient, except maybe the proverbial kitchen sink, right? And how did it all turn out? Well, you already saw at least one of the top line results of this trial. It didn't work out pretty well. On this slide are shown the primary and secondary endpoints of BHF readmission at 30, and at 180 days, mortality at 30, and at 180 days, absolutely no difference between the intervention or telemonitoring arm and the control arm in this trial. So perhaps after three decades of pursuing this approach to managing heart failure patients, it's time to do something different. Well, on the road to heart failure hospitalization, what happens uh, earlier? Well, we notice that there are changes in intrathoracic and transthoracic impedance and, and, and certain biomarkers, including autonomic adaptation, which may be manifest as changes in heart rate or heart rate variability, for example. And in fact, now there are emerging many very good wearable devices. Uh, but for a while, we focused on the study of telemedicine focused on cardiac implantable electronic device-based physiological markers. So these are the physiological markers that can be uh, gained from implantable CRT and ICD devices in our heart failure patients. And they include things like resting or nighttime heart rate, heart rate variability, patient activity level, intrathoracic impedance, and then arrhythmia monitoring, particularly for AF burden, ventricular rate during AF, percent CRT pacing, VT episodes, and shocks. And to make a long story short, the data that focuses primarily on, on the device, the functioning of the device, and arrhythmia monitoring has proven to be very useful and to alter clinical outcomes in a favorable way. To date, the parameters that focus on the physiological measures of heart failure clinical status have proven to be useful uh, as predictors of worsening heart failure. The sensitivity is very high, the specificity is reasonably high, but the positive predictive value tends to be low, and to date the information hasn't yet translated into something which has been actionable. And in the only randomized controlled trial completed to date, using these implantable EP device-based uh, physiological markers, the DOT-HF trial, things actually went in the wrong direction. So this was a prospective randomized controlled intervention trial of intrathoracic impedance monitoring, a treatment arm, a control arm, so uh, uh, intrathoracic impedance was used in the treatment arm, and you can see the characteristics of the patients enrolled, but again for time's sake, just to get to the punchline here, the, the trial demonstrated a, an increase, about a threefold increase, in the number of outpatient clinic visits. That wasn't surprising nor unexpected because the investigators predicted that if there was an optival fluid threshold crossing, the clinician would want to see the patient in the outpatient clinic. But what was surprising and, and, and the opposite of the hypothesis was there was also a nearly twofold increase in the number of heart failure hospitalizations. And this was because the data wasn't actionable. So what do you do with a patient when you're worried about them, when you get an alert that says they're at risk for a hospitalization and you worry about them but you don't know what to do? Well, you might actually have an increased tendency to hospitalize them. So this didn't go in the right direction. 
So now let's take a look at this road to heart failure hospitalization at what the very earliest manifestations of change are. And it turns out that they are changes in pressure or absolute lung fluid content. So this brings us now to uh, telemedicine focused on intracardiac and pulmonary artery pressures. And I'll say parenthetically on, on devices which are emerging that can provide absolute measurement of lung fluid content, very different from impedance-based technologies. So let's look at some of the trials of implantable hemodynamic monitors. These are monitors that measure either intracardiac pressure, such as left atrial pressure, RV pressure, or they measure pulmonary artery pressure. And of course, the one successful example the one device that is available for commercial use, the CardioMEMS heart failure system, is a pulmonary artery pressure monitoring or measurement system. And I'll come to that in just a moment, but I do want to set the stage by reviewing briefly with you a trial called the Compass HF trial, which preceded the Champion trial and represented the first randomized controlled trial of an implantable hemodynamic monitor. This was a right ventricular pressure monitoring system, which by virtue of also being able to measure positive and negative RV DPDT could estimate from the RV waveform the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. And, and this was a trial that uh, set out to look in a relatively smallish group of patients, a somewhat under, uh, underpowered trial, 274 patients, to see whether or not using this information could keep patients out of the hospital. Now, at the time this trial was designed in the late 90s, appreciate that we uh, you know, were operating under some myths or, 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 or with a lack of knowledge about what the target pressure should be. So we introduced into this trial a concept of optivolemia, and we had no pressure targets in this trial. What was optivolemia? Essentially, we said to the investigator, you decide what pressure is best for your patient, because we, you know, we don't know exactly what it should be. And so if the investigator saw, thought the patient looked good, and the patient said they felt okay, even if they're pulmonary artery diastolic pressure was 35, that could be called optivolemic, and the patient could be left there. And it turns out that from the beginning of the study to the end of the study, the average reduction in the pulmonary artery pressure in the treatment group was just under two millimeters of mercury. So we didn't do a very good job lowering the pressures here. So that was one of the lessons that we learned. But a couple of the great lessons that we learned from this trial were, one, we did demonstrate a very clear correlation between pulmonary artery diastolic pressure and the risk for heart failure events. This paper published in 2010, first author Lynn Stevenson, shows you that beginning at an estimated pulmonary artery diastolic pressure of around 22 to 25, there is a linear increase in the risk of heart failure hospitalization. From there on down to about uh, pressure of about 10, there is a very steep and nearly linear reduction in the risk of heart failure hospitalization, and then lower pressures don't result in any, any further reductions in risk. So now to put this data in the context of, of that, that earlier goal I described of keeping patients just right, we could conclude that these patients are too wet, patients with elevated pulmonary artery diastolic pressures, and those are the patients who are at highest risk for heart failure hospitalization. These patients might be too dry, at least they don't seem to benefit, and they don't seem to derive any benefit from further pressure lowering, and these are the just right patients. And it turns out that just right happens to fall about within the normal range of pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. So when we went into the CHAMPION trial, we did a few things uh, different. Um, so first of all, here, here is the monitoring system that was used in the CHAMPION trial and which is available. This is a wireless MEMS-based pressure sensor. I suspect many of you have seen it, but if you haven't, it's about the size of a small paper clip. There's no battery, so there's nothing to wear out or to be replaced. There's virtually no moving parts, so there's nothing to break. The reliability of the sensor is incredible. 
We have patients implanted in the initial pilot study who have now had a functioning sensor for more than 10 years. Uh, it is implanted using, using simple right heart catheterization technique. So any cardiologist can implant this device. At our center, our heart failure specialists uh, implant them at others, interventionalists or EPs or general cardiologists. But any cardiologist with the skill of right heart catheterization can implant the device. And the way it works, you might say, well, how did, you know, it has no battery. How, how does this actually work? The patient lays down on this specialized pillow that's shown on the lower left-hand corner of the slide and pushes one button. Then what happens is that with an antenna embedded in that pillow, via radio frequency, the device is simultaneously powered, the pressure waveform is extracted using the bedside electronic, the base station, all of that is then sent electronically, wirelessly to a HIPAA compliant uh, uh, a website for clinician inspection, and you can look at trended data such as that shown on the lower right hand corner of the slide, or you can look at PA pressure waveforms or discrete numerical data. And the example that I've put on the slide is exemplary of what we uh, uh, attempted and I think succeeded in doing in the champion trial and that was if the pressures were elevated at baseline as in this example you immediately began to alter medications increase the dose of the diuretic add or increase the dose of the vasodilator to bring those pressures down into a target range I'll show you the target ranges in a couple of slides and then the goal was to keep it there proactive heart failure therapy, not waiting until the patient gets wet again, but maintaining stability within a normal target range to present the lowest risk of heart failure hospitalization to these patients. So I know the lighting's not good in the room, and this is an incredibly busy slide, but it, it describes the design of the CHAMPION trial. 550 patient, randomized controlled trial, single blinded, all patients got the device, all patients were blinded to study assignment, 270 randomized to the treatment arm, that meant that the physicians had access to the pressure data, 280 patients randomized to a control arm, that meant they did not have access to the pressure data, all patients managed with traditional information or standard of care heart failure disease management. We included patients with HEF, REF, and HEF, PEF. There was no EF criteria. We randomized on the basis of EF, stratified randomization based on an EF of 40% so that we could do a pre-specified subgroup analysis based on HEF, REF versus HEF, PEF, and followed all patients until the last patient reached six months uh, of follow-up. So here are the pressure targets uh, in the treatment arm. We told investigators that ideally we would like to see the PA systolic in a range of 15 to 35, PA diastolic 8 to 20, PA mean 10 to 25. We primarily targeted management based on the PA diastolic pressure because some of these patients had WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension. You have to take into account the difference between the PAD and the, and, and the wedge pressure at the time of implantation. And sometimes the, the, the mean pressure is brought up by the, by the pulmonary artery systolic pressure in those WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension patients. So, you know, we thought that a PA diastolic was, was the right pressure to target for management. And the management algorithms were pretty simple. This is not rocket science. This is what you do every day in, in, in uh, managing heart failure patients. But the idea was that it could be done with more definite and more actionable information. So if the patient had elevated PA pressures, what do you do? Add or increase a diuretic. If that didn't bring the pressure down, perhaps this wasn't all about fluid overload. Maybe there was a vascular component. Uh, a lack of adequate venous capacitance uh, because heart failure patients get venous constriction. And so at that point, we suggested adding or increasing uh, the dose of a vasodilator. And what did all of this result in? It resulted in highly significant reductions in heart failure hospitalizations. Over the full duration of the randomized study, there was a 33% reduction in the rate of heart failure hospitalization. It also resulted in a significant reduction in the combined endpoint of death due to any cause or heart failure hospitalizations. And the effect was large enough that it also resulted in a significant reduction in all-cause hospitalizations and the combined endpoint of all-cause death or all-cause hospitalizations. That was in the entire cohort of patients regardless of LV ejection fraction.
Now, what about the HEFPEF co uh, cohort? As you know, we don't have any treatment strategy that has been proven to improve HEFPEF, to keep HEFPEF patients out of the hospital. We've studied ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, and beta blockers. There's a large ongoing trial of Entresto now in the HEFPEF population, and we're waiting for the results of that trial. But to date, we don't have effective therapies for HEFPEF. Well, in the pre-specified subgroup analysis in the CHAMPION trial, those patients defined with HEFPEF by an ejection fraction of 40% or greater experienced a 50, that's 5-0, 50 percent reduction in the rate of heart failure hospitalization. First trial to show convincingly a reduction of heart failure hospitalization in the diastolic heart failure population. Now I'll just mention parenthetically on this slide you'll see there's another column because the reviewers of this paper at Circulation Heart Failure said, okay we understand you pre-specified up a cutoff at 40 percent, but what about patients with truly normal ejection fractions? Why don't you repeat the analysis and use a cutoff of 50 percent? They, they did even better. The relative risk reduction was 70 percent, 70 percent with a normal ejection fraction. And then finally, I'll just show you some data on some of the other subgroups that have been evaluated. These are all retrospective analyses, but if you look at history of MI, concomitant COPD, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease, uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressure guided heart failure therapy was shown to be safe and effective in all of these common uh, uh, subgroups of heart failure patients. Now let me give you a little bit of data from the real world now. You can say, well that looks good, but that's a randomized controlled trial in a very controlled setting. How is this all working out in community practice? There are two recent publications, I mean literally within the past two months, that, uh, that went into print. The first is from uh, Tom Haywood uh, at, uh, at, at, at Scripps that looked at the real-world cardiomems experience in the first 2,000 patients in general use following FDA approval uh, of the device. This table shows uh, a comparison between the clinical characteristics of the CHAMPION trial patients and the general use cohort, and you'll notice that the general use cohort is more indicative of the real world heart failure population. So in CHAMPION the average age was about 62 years and in the general use cohort about 70 years very close to the actual average age of the heart failure population, which is about 71 or 72 years. You'll see that there was a greater representation of women in the general use cohort, more HEFPEF patients in the general use cohort, and at baseline the pulmonary artery pressures were a little bit higher. Now, Haywood wanted to address two questions with this, with this, uh, with this study, with this analysis. One was, how well did patients in the real world adhere to the CardioMEMS heart failure system. How well did they take their daily measurements? Well, it turns out that patients fairly consistently uploaded their pressures from home as asked on a daily basis. What's shown on this slide are the days between transmissions. So if all patients were taking a measurement every day, the number would be one. At the end of one month, it was 1.07. At the end of nine months, it was 1.27. So there was a little bit of, of, of a trend towards you know, lesser adherence to those daily measurements by nine months. But on average, these patients are taking a measurement about six out of every seven days. And frankly, that's probably good enough because you saw that the road to decompensation is, is, is a slow one. How well did clinicians do using the information you know, Mike and I were talking about this earlier, you can have all the sensors in the world even if they meet all those prerequisites that I mentioned earlier, if clinicians don't act on the information, you can guarantee the outcomes won't be improved, right? And this was one of my biggest concerns about, uh, you know, what might happen in the post-approval setting with CardioMEMS. You know, clinicians might be excited about implanting the device but not use the data. Well, it turns out, and now as a uh, co-PI for the CHAMPION trial, I think I might almost be embarrassed to say this, but in the real world, clinicians are doing a better job than we did in the randomized controlled trial. So as you look at these curves, what you're looking at is the, the, the area under the curve, pressure reduction over time, the same measurement used in the CHAMPION trial. 
The top line, the red line, is the champion control group where you see the pressures go up a little bit, natural history of heart failure. The black line, the one in the middle, is the champion treatment arm where we demonstrated a significant reduction in pulmonary artery pressures. But that blue line, the, the lowest one, the one that goes down most steeply, comes from the general use cohort. In clinical practice, providers are consistently treating pressures and they are lowering them very substantially. So then comes the next study. This one comes from Akshay Desai, Lynn Stevenson at the Brigham, uh, along with a multi-center group of, of collaborators. They also wanted to understand what was going on with the real world utilization of pulmonary artery pressure guided heart failure management. But now rather than looking at patient and clinician adherence to the system, they wanted to look at clinical outcomes. You know, could we demonstrate? Of course, there's no parallel control group. Uh, the data here come from the Medicare Administrative Claims data set, the CMS standard analytic file. So they looked at fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries undergoing implantation of the sensor between June 1st, 2014 and December 31st, 2015. And then they used the standard analytic file to look at heart failure hospitalization before implantation versus heart failure hospitalization after implantation, and then actually did a, a cost analysis as well. Again, the cohort, uh, they looked at patients for whom they had six months, the primary cohort as well as 12 month, a secondary cohort. The, 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 the characteristics of the patients is much more reflective of real world heart failure patients, average age 71 and a half, more HEFPEF, more women, more comorbidities, and so on and so forth. But again, to get to the punchline here, you will see that uh, the champion findings are virtually replicated by this real world experience. If you look at the graph on the right hand side of the slide, you're looking at cumulative heart failure hospitalizations pre-implant, shown in red, post-implant shown in blue and and the relative risk reduction is 51 percent. You can see a reduction in all cause as well as heart failure hospitalizations and no increase. There's a numerical decrease in non-heart failure hospitalizations. Same picture at 12 months so the effect appears to be durable and when one uh, looked, when Desai and colleagues looked at health care costs before and after the pulmonary artery pressure sensor implantation, pre-implant again in red, post-implant in blue, you can see that the, that the costs went down. Well, let me uh, mention that CardioMEMS is, uh, is not the end of the story, but simply the beginning of the story because there are a lot more pressure monitors to come. What's shown on this slide are just a few of the, of the implantable hemodynamic monitors that are under either preclinical or clinical invest, uh, in investigation. Other pulmonary artery pressure sensors, some direct left atrial pressure monitoring systems. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we'll be seeing more uh, uh, utilization of implantable hemodynamic monitoring in the future. Now that brings me to the question, should everybody get an implantable hemodynamic monitor, everybody with heart failure? Well, I, I think the answer is no, and there are emerging non-invasive technologies that may provide data which is absolute and, and actionable and may allow us to implement a CardioMEMS-like treatment algorithm or paradigm. And for time's sake, I'm going to so show you just one of these, but there, there are more than one. This one is, is, uh, is called uh, REDS technology. Uh, it, uh, it employs a radar-based technology. This is a technology that has been used for years, uh, both by the military and by uh, civilian uh, authorities, for example, to look through walls to see if there's a terrorist on the other side of the wall or to look through rubble to, to look for earthquake survivals, survivors. And it's been miniaturized into a small sensor system that can be strapped on via a vest for a momentary measurement. So the sensors are embedded in a wearable vest, takes 90 seconds to get a measurement, and the measurement provides an absolute measure of lung fluid content, not a relative one.
And through study, we've determined that the normal lung, your lung and my lung, if we took a measurement today, will have a fluid content between 20% and 35% of the, of the lung volume is fluid. If it's higher than that, the lung's wet. And if it's lower than that, the lung is, 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 uh, is dry. And because the measurement is absolute in that sense, one may be able to implement, again, a cardiomems type paradigm for treatment. And here's one example here of heart failure management using this REDS technology. And you can see that the curve here looks strikingly similar to what I showed you earlier for cardiomems. At the beginning, when the system, uh, uh, when the measurement is first made in this patient, you can see that the fluid content is about 45%. That's too high. Diuretics were increased and it was brought down into this normal normally dry lung range and then the goal was to keep it there and at the end of the tracing you'll see that the values are starting to go back up and that's when the clinician should respond and increase a dose of a diuretic for example and bring that REDS value back down. So in a pilot study that we performed in 50 patients this is an observational study with a before and a during and an after observation we were able to demonstrate a marked reduction in the daily hazard for a heart failure hospitalization. Truly remarkable uh, reductions. This paper was just, uh, just published recently in the International Journal of Cardiology. It actually showed, and, and, and I don't think these results are replicable in a randomized controlled trial, uh, but it actually showed a 93% a 90, uh, reduction in, in the daily risk of heart failure hospitalization. So we have enrolled about uh, half, now more than half of the patients in a randomized controlled, parallel controlled outcome study uh, of this particular approach to heart failure management. So now let me come to what I think is the last chapter here, and I'm going to call this telemedicine focused on integration of multiple physiological and behavioral inputs. And we've already heard a lot about that today. I mean, the emerging technologies are really amazing, aren't they? The wearable sensors, the implantable sensors, the you know various means to evaluate physiology and, and behavior are really quite striking and we may be able to combine some of these measures into, into an actionable paradigm for heart failure disease management. Let me give you two examples of, of some things that are in development. Uh, uh, this this uh, shown on this slide uh, is an introduction to the MD2K project, the Mobile Data to Knowledge Project, which is an NIH big data center of excellence. I wanted to present this for a couple of reasons. One, we're participating in this at Ohio State University, but this is a 13 academic uh, uh, institution consortium, uh, which happens to also include UCSF, UCLA, and UCSD as well. So there's relevance for this in California. And one of the two major projects of MD2K uh, is focused on, on heart failure. And we're looking at a multi-sensor approach to minimize the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Some of these are standard off-the-shelf sensors, uh, such as standard Bluetooth connected scales or blood pressure monitorings. Some are wristbands, and then there is some new technology development here. Uh, one of our bioengineers at Ohio State has developed a monitor called EasySense, which can detect both heart motion and also lung fluid uh, levels. So we think we can get measures of cardiac performance or contractility along with a measurement of, uh, uh, of lung fluid content from that device and combining it with all of these other measures. In addition, we're using smartphone and other technology, GPS-based technologies, accelerometers, and so on and so forth, to better understand behavior in these patients. It was mentioned earlier, and it's the same example I use. For example, we can tell using the GPS technology when our heart failure patient walks into McDonald's, and we can send them some, some reinforcement uh, about uh, you know why why that's not a good thing you know for them for them to do, you can tell with wrist motion with gesture recognition you can tell when patients you know might be consuming too much fluid 
or one of the other projects in MT2K is focused on smoking cessation, you can tell when patients are, are smoking and you can provide uh, some, some feedback to them in regard to that as well. Now the other system I wanted to tell you about, and for full disclosure, I've, I've, I've had quite a bit of input into the design of this particular system, uh, comes from uh, a startup called Gazuntite. Uh, this is uh, the catchphrase here is tech-driven patient provider interactive platform. And, and the reason why I'm enthusiastic about this is it, it, it sort of takes the best, I think, the best of what you know, others are trying to do out there and it combines it into a single platform. Uh, it looks beyond just smartphone technology or, or some of the sensors that we've already talked about and it can incorporate any type of sensor technology that you want to bring to it. Uh, but it also takes into account all other sources of interactions, land, landlines, devices like the Google Home Assistant and can even gather uh, uh, data indirectly through authorized friends and, and family. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 we recognized that, that it, it required a unique combination of critical functions and so there are six functions and sub-features that achieve the full multi-purpose healthcare IT platform empowering the patient with the same tools as the provider so really everything that's available, virtually everything that's available to the provider is available to the, to the patient and the interaction between uh, the two is, is promoted. And again, I, you know, for lack of time, I, you know, I have to summarize these things in just a few slides, but you can see that there are, here are the six features, record exchange, a feature called seek and meet. Uh, where, where you can seek providers based on a multiple search criteria, meet doctors through online appointments, and so on and so forth. And as I'll show you in the minutes, one of the things that we've accomplished, which is not easy to accomplish uh, on smartphone platforms, is a split screen technology, which allows face-to-face -face interaction during ongoing review of data and on the physician side documentation of that interaction in real time. Uh, a, a feature called uh, Augmented uh, Empathy, uh, which uh, uh, provides access in real time to a team of providers. Uh, the exchange essentially addresses some of the, some of the economics around this, the ability to do face-to-face -face remote tele uh, uh, um, um, medical uh, uh, exchanges and, and to be able to bill for those in real time online. Uh, over the shoulder feature which means uh, clinicians uh, looking at their patients and, and then a heart failure social network built into this as well. So when the patient says, uh, gosh, my doctor just told me I need an LVAD, rather than meeting one or two LVAD patients at, at my center, they can meet dozens or hundreds of LVAD patients uh, around the country. And it looks, uh, it all looks something like this. And I know my time has run out, so I'm not going to go through uh, everything on this slide except to point out some of the advantages of this split screen technology, which can allow face to face, either peer to peer or, or, or physician or provider to patient interaction uh, with, uh, along with real time data review uh, and documentation. So this is my last slide and I'm going to summarize uh, you know, where we've been and where we're going on the road to heart failure decompensation. And I hope I've convinced you that, uh, and I've referenced some of, the, some of the studies at the bottom, but that weight monitoring of weight changes and heart failure symptoms provides unreliable, late, and only indirect markers of heart failure decompensation and isn't a very effective way to keep patients out of the hospital. Monitoring uh, other parameters such as autonomic function or, or intrathoracic impedance may be used in risk stratification but currently don't have the fidelity to provide us with actionable information. Maybe through machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches, one day they will. But at the present time, uh, monitoring or managing heart failure on the basis of intracardiac or pulmonary artery pressure enables proactive and personalized heart failure management and helps us keep heart failure patients out of the hospital. Thank you for your attention. I have a question. So what do you think the uptake, what, what are the limitations in the uptake of the CardioMEMS device currently? Yeah, for, you know, first of all, I would say that there, you know, there is, there is a sense that the uptake has been slow and somewhat disappointing, although if you look at the uptake, uptake of other breakthroughs in heart failure, 
such as ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, or more recently, Ivabradine and, 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 and Valsartan Sacubitril, you know, they've also had relatively slow, slow trajectories. But I think a unique challenge for cardiomems is that the cost is upfront. So there's, you know, there's a large upfront cost rather than a cost spread out over many years by taking a pill. Uh, and in addition to that, there have been in some geographies reimbursement challenges as, as well. In Ohio, for example, the reimbursement is good. We put in a lot of them. Next door in Pennsylvania, the, the reimbursement is poor and they don't put in very many of them. So, so I think reimbursement has been a bit of a unique problem. Uh, in uh, in the uptake of, of cardiomems. And what about healthcare systems that are taking risk, like places like Kaiser or Geisinger? Are they have they been interested in using this type of technology to decrease their overall healthcare expenditures? Yeah, I th I think there is a I think there's a growing interest about, about you know among those kind of you know at risk systems. Uh, if you look at the data, you know from the Champion trial. And there have been some cost effectiveness analyses done around that. And then look at the, the data from Desai. You know, the, the break even point uh, is around one and a half to two years. So, you know, if, if you've got a, you know, if you've, if you've got a captive audience, a captive group of patients who you know you're going to have in the system for a prolonged period of time, you will get the cost back out. You'll get that upfront cost back out. On, on the back end, and it doesn't take that long to get it. I mean, a, you know, a year or two years, a year and a half or two years. Um, thanks, Bill. That was really impressive data. Um, so I think a key factor in, you know, getting your money back, so to speak, near the end, and one of the key topics people asked about uh, earlier today was this engagement part and persistence. And, you know, you, the data that you showed in terms of this more real-world experience um, really stood out as to people really continuing with the monitoring. What do you think the reason is there? Because that seems obviously, you know, the classic Fitbit in the in the drawer after a few months, um, you know, phrase that people use is the other end of the spectrum. Um, what do you think really keeps people engaged with having to do this measurement every day or, well, you know, six out of seven days a week? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know the answer. I can only speculate on it. But, you know, one, uh, you know, I, I would wonder whether or not um, having an implantable device uh, is, is sort of a more powerful, you know, message to the patient. You've taken them through a procedure to get them there. And, and, and perhaps, uh, and we, you know, we do know with other implantable devices that there is a device implant related effect you know, on, on these kind of things. Uh, but the other part of it is, I, I, I think it is the fact that the data is really actionable, uh, that the patient knows that, you know, something can be done with the information, uh, you know, as compared to some of the other monitoring systems that, you know, that, that we've tested. So, you know, there is a more continuous sort of feedback here. You know, when you see the pressures change, there's really an interaction that occurs between generally a heart failure nurse or a nurse practitioner and the patient. And so there's this ongoing interaction back and forth. I do think the non-invasive approaches, you know, will work as we begin to, you know, get that, that feedback, you know, loop working better with the patient. Tim. You know, some of it I think goes back to what Steve talked about before. First, this is a targeted patient population that is sick. They feel it. That so too. patients are motivated because they feel it when they're more short of breath and they're swelling in their feet. Number two, the places where it's been really successful, there's systems in place and in, in, incentives aligned. So it's a good example of how it can be done and the opportunities to do it with those things in place. But it's really, really nicely done and shows us not only where we are, but where we can go. Well, thank you, and I, I think you're right on. Uh, thank you very much for taking us on that journey. Thank you. Because you, you were the pilot, and so th thank you for giving us that perspective. My question has to do with the real-world studies which were just published. They were fairly severely criticized by Harlan Krumholtz because of their design. And it made me start thinking about some of the things you're talking about, and that is, if you had the same end users and the same personnel dealing with the patients, and you could create a study comparing, say, cardiomems, 
to standard telemonitoring? Might we gain more information? And do you think a study like that could ever be done? Yeah, well, I, I think those types of studies, it would be worthwhile doing those types of studies. You know, since, you know, since we know the sort of standard of care telemonitoring approaches, you know, versus just sort of standard of care, sort of no, no telemonitoring approaches, you know, have, have failed consistently, you know, I think, it's, I think it's unlikely that, you know, that they would beat cardiomems. But, you know, I, I think it's reasonable to continue to do this, particularly as new technologies come along. I have to say one of the things I've been most impressed by today have been some of the other technologies that I've heard about. And, and I'm, you know, really anxious to see us study all of those because, you know, I certainly don't believe that every patient needs an implantable device. I, you know, I, you know, I want us to find uh, better non-invasive or less invasive means to replicate that data. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so the question was if cardio MEMS cost $500, would we, would we have any issue? Right? And I think the answer is absolutely no. You know, I think somewhere between five hundred dollars and I think it costs about seventeen thousand or some sixteen, seventeen thousand, probably somewhere between there is is where, you know, you know, where, where the utilization could, could probably expand more substantially. But I think your point is very well taken. Thank you very much.